nanohub.org. So I wanted to take um, a little bit of time and talk about troubleshooting measurements and the system. The, the 4200 is a very powerful, flexible system, but it's used in a, in a very wide variety of applications. Um, if problems occur, you want to do two things. One, you want to recognize that a problem's occurred in the measurement. I can't tell you how many papers I review that I can clearly see bad data in them, okay? And number two, you want to know how to resolve the problem. So we have a few steps that will kind of help walk you through that process. Try to help you diagnose the problem in the system. Now, okay, we tried to reduce this to a flow chart. It's always very difficult to simplify a flow chart, but we'll see what we can do. So what you want to do is try to separate the symptom from the cause. You want to clearly define the symptom of what it is that you're seeing. So you want to fit, verify that that symptom fits the criteria of a faulty operation. So if it's hardware, you want to compare that symptom to a published spec. Now that seems obvious, but I'll bet you 50% of the phone calls and emails that we get for technical support are people that are trying to measure something that's beyond our spec. Now the Keithley is truly an amazing tool and it measures as close to Johnson noise limits really as, as, as really almost anything you'll find out there. But people just aren't aware of Johnson noise limits. They're not aware of the limits of measurement and they really don't look at the spec of the instrument. So always compare your your spec to what it is you're trying to measure. You might be trying to measure something the instrument can't measure. Now, is the symptom persistent or intermittent? If it's persistent, you want to document all the conditions that cause it and see if you can reproduce it on another system. Now that's particularly, it's easier for you here at Purdue since you've got as many as five of these systems around here. So you have an opportunity to go to another system and say, boy, am I seeing the same problem somewhere else? Man, that is a fast, easy troubleshooting technique that says that instrument's broken, this one's not. But if it's intermittent, it's difficult to try to find those variables that cause the problem. So you have to try to begin to Use a little bit of design of experiment mentality to try to narrow the variables that are actually causing the problem. Now, in some cases, you'll want to separate the machine from the environment and test the machine itself. So for example, I don't know if the cables or my probe station or my device is bad, you know, and I can't tell by looking at the measurement. So what I can do is disconnect the cables from the machine, put it in a known state, and see if the machine, machine seems to be performing the way it's supposed to be. Now I can tell you in terms of the new CV that we've added to this instrument, we actually added a new capability in here that we call a confidence check. It's a beautiful thing. Basically, it goes out there and says, hook up your cables, hook up your probes, and I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna measure it and see if I can detect any problems in your cables and probes and system. I'm gonna give you some confidence that the system's working properly. So it's got a great diagnostic routine built into the CV meter itself that tries to uh, validate the system for you. And when we actually get on the system, I'll show you the buttons that you press to get that to work. So if you can identify the machine is the problem, then obviously you have to return the machine for repair. Alternatively, it becomes an applications problem. Something in the way it's connected or something in the device or something in the setup of the instrument. So here's one way to start up and begin troubleshooting. You connect your 4200 to the power, connect the keyboard, press the power on button, Press the power on, and it goes through a series of internal self-checks. It checks its CPU, it goes through a boot up, like a computer, it, all the instruments go through an internal self-check. If everything is okay, you get a login notice. If you get a login notice, move on. The, the system's passed its first phase of checks. But if not, you might have some kind of BIOS errors, in which case, 
don't jump into our bios. <laughs> You're really not supposed to do that. In the early days of the 4200, we actually locked the bios and locked the OS. But it turns out that we don't do that anymore. If you jump in the BIOS and start changing things around, I, I can tell you, you're going to break it, right? The 4200 is set up to operate in a specific way. Don't try to fix the BIOS. And something else you can't do, you absolutely cannot reload Windows. I mean, that's standard operating procedure on your desktop or your laptop. If it gets to the point the computer is not working well, all right, step back and reload Windows and start over again. You cannot do that on the 4200. If you reload Windows, you will break the machine and it will have to come back to the factory for repair. All right. So if you power it up, you get no lights or sounds. Well, first of all, make sure it's plugged in. Secondly, make sure that it's, I'm telling you, we've had people not plug it in before. Make sure that the fuse is good. The fuse is easily checked, okay? Um, <clears throat> make sure that the power cord is properly attached. I've seen power cords, you know, it's a removable power cord. It can hang out a little bit, right? <clears throat> If all that, and make sure that there's power in the wall. <laughs> a lot of times people plug it into a dead outlet on the wall. So it seems obvious, but check those things. Now, if you've got LEDs and you've got sounds, but your, your LCD doesn't light up, you don't see an image, you don't see it, but everything else is kind of clicking and banging, it's broken. You have to send it back to the factory. Okay, so remember, go to the next slide, it powered on, you can log in. Windows loads okay. No, Windows didn't load okay. There's some errors, there's some problem. Well, there's a small chance that you can call the Keithley Factory Applications Engineer and it may be something he can help you with. You can certainly give that a try. I would not recommend you going in and fiddling around with Windows itself. We've got Windows very highly tuned in this system, okay? Probably it has to come back to the factory for repair. Now, in time critical applications, if you're in some very critical application, we can actually recreate the hard drive back in the factory, send you out the hard drive, and you can plug a new hard drive into it. But I want to remind you when we do that, your data is gone. Your tests are gone. So you always want to take care to back up your critical data and your critical tests, particularly if you're writing your own code. Make sure that you keep a memory stick handy and keep your data backed up. It is a Windows system. We use a high reliability drive. This is an industrial drive in here. We rarely lose drives. We use a high reliability CPU. We rarely lose them. But it is a Windows-based system. And all the problems that you have with Windows potentially could hit this system. Now, Windows loads OK. And all the Kite applications launch OK. No. Right? Well, if your cut applications aren't launching okay, something could have happened, and you can actually reload kite from the CD. A CD came with the system, and when you buy or uh, get the free upgrades, it comes on a CD. You can actually reload kite from the CD, and sometimes that'll fix the problem. All right? But if all the kite applications launch okay, then the system's probably okay, and you've got an applications problem. Applications troubleshooting, the program won't run properly. If the program does not run, you have an error, a hang, or a freeze, or if a program runs okay and the unexpected results occur, come down here and take a look at the Kite software on a single ITM. I can't get the ITM to run. I, there's no green run button. Well, we added the little check boxes to the Project Navigator. Everybody forgets to check the check box. If the check box isn't checked, the green run button doesn't light up. We get calls on that one all the time. <clears throat> if it's brand new, you have to do a save of it. If you've created it brand new from scratch, you have to do a save. When you do a save, Kite validates the test and enables the green button. Okay. And there is also a status tab in the ITM that a lot of times will give you some information as to why the test is not executable. So take a look at the status tab.
If it's a user test module, one of the C code algorithms that we wrote or that you wrote, the thing to look for is a memory access violation. Um, in C program, they're very strict about how you access memory. And if there's an error in the code and it steps on itself in memory, you can get this error occasionally. If you're trying to run a device or a subsite test plan and it won't run, make sure the checkbox is enabled. If you're trying to do a multi-site project, you press the run button instead of the subsite level run button. Now we actually didn't cover multi-site projects. That's one of the slides I just realized I forgot. Um, you remember the project tree? Well, the project tree actually can exist in the third dimension. So you can have a project tree behind a project tree behind a project tree. Each project tree is called a site. So multiple sites are when you have multiple project trees. If you double click on the highest level, the wafer level we call it, that will open up the wafer level and you can set up multiple sites. When you select two, three, four, five sites, it basically in software duplicates that project tree five times. Okay, And um, in order to run looping at that level, you have to, you have to run the looping button for that project level. Um, you mentioned uh, AutoCal. How often do we have to run AutoCal? AutoCal, you actually have to rarely run. Most people don't ever run it. If you're really pushing, not the preamps, but just the source measure unit, low currents, doesn't hurt to run AutoCal. But if AutoCal ever fail, fails, first thing you do, run it again. Make sure nothing's connected to it and see if it passes. If it doesn't, then, then you've got a hardware problem. <clears throat> Applications troubleshooting the program will not run property properly if we're in Colt. Well, Colt is the Keithley user library tool. It's our programming environment. Most people don't go there. They don't go there very often when they do. If you get compile errors, this is a programming error, right? Um, the tool that we give you usually will tell you what the compile error is, and it will usually point you right at it. So look in the build tab to see those errors. Uh, correct the code, read the error description, and usually clicking the error message highlights the area in the code where the problem is. Now build errors are a little different than compile errors. Build errors are when we take multiple compiled objects and put them together. Okay? <clears throat> I'm not a programmer. So I only have a surface level knowledge of this. Um, build errors are usually when you have dependencies. A dependency is when one set of object code is trying to call a subroutine or a, a function from another set of object code. And you have to make sure and tell them who each other is. That's the dependencies in there. And those will give you build errors. Um, Module library locked. So this Keithley user library tool was intended in a multi-user environment on a production systems. And as such, we go in and we do file locking to keep multiple people from making changes simultaneously. That normally doesn't happen in this environment. However, the file locking is still there. And every once in a while, the locks will turn on and you'll start to get uh, module library locked errors. There's a little routine in there called Colt Clean Locks. You just go to a DOS prompt and type in Colt Clean Locks and it goes and unlocks all files. So it's just a little artifact that happens. Um, sometimes a file will get locked and this is how you can unlock it. Now, the Keithley external command interface. This is if you've got a separate computer running LabVIEW or some other program trying to control the instrument. Um, the Keith external command interface actually has a troubleshooting interface right on the front panel. So if you're getting an error, you can actually just read the error code right off the front panel. And then it's usually just a matter of verifying that you have the correct command syntax in the correct order. All right, KCON is the Keithley Configuration Manager. This is how the system manages itself 
and everything it's attached to. For example, you here at Purdue have the Keithley Simultaneous CV system, the Model 82. When you attach the Model 82 to this via the GPIB communications cable, you will need to go into KCON and tell it, I've attached a Model 82, all right? And then you'll tell it in KCON what the GPIB addresses and things are. Once you've done that, then the 4200 is now capable of controlling the Model 82 hardware. That same thing applies to probe stations, 4980s. We have drivers for the 4980s in here um, and other instrumentation. I think there's some cryo chamber drivers. There's some thermal chuck drivers. KCON manages all those connections and manages the internal instrumentation. S opens as read-only, can't save changes. You can't run validate and can't run smooth self-test. So if you've got kite open, or you've got Colt open, or you've got any other Keithley software open, and you try to open KCON, it will open as read-only. So you can go make changes, you go to hit save, and it won't save them, because you have other programs open accessing it. So if you want to make changes in KCON, make sure all other Keithley software is shut off. The validate configuration fails. So validate configuration is a button in KCON that says, I'm gonna go check everything that you told me is in here. So it's missing some SMUs or preamps or some other external instruments, something. If it's missing an internal instrument, you got a serious hardware problem you need repair. If you're missing an external instrument, maybe the GPIB cable got unhooked, maybe it wasn't powered up, Maybe somebody changed the GPIB address. So the validate configuration attempts to validate everything that you've told it is connected to it. If that's no longer connected, you're going to have to remove it from there. Um, if you're using a switch matrix, KCON asks you to define the pins of the switch matrix. Uh, one of the gentlemen in here earlier was telling me he has the switch matrix in there. Um, <clears throat> You need uh, a missing pins when configuring switch. You need to add a pro prober or a test fixture. In other words, you have to tell the switch matrix, I've got something connected out there. It's either a probe station with five pins or it's a test fixture with 10 pins. But if I don't specify something, the switch matrix has nothing to connect to. So you have to go ahead and add something to the KCON that tells it, I've got some number of pins out there. And that, that is a prober or a test fixture. Okay, our complete reference, our online documentation, if you double click the icon, which opens an HTML file, but no links are visible, all right? You have to enable pops up. Win, Win XP Service Pack 2 disables pop ups by default. Now, we don't recommend running Service Pack 2 anymore. All right. Um, in fact, if you go in and try to install Kite 7.1 or later and you're on Service Pack 2, bad things will happen. So if you're on Service Pack 2 with one of your older systems, Get it online and download all the Service Pack 3 stuff and bring your windows up to speed. And then get the latest kite, which is currently 8.1, and get that up to speed. Okay. So in kite, your results are close to expected, but suboptimal. Maybe it's more noise. Maybe you've got data offsets. Results differ from some other instrument. Well, make sure both instruments have sort of similar settings. Now, we've talked about settling time, about speed, about noise, about current range. All of those impact the measurements. So imagine you have an instrument which runs in 10 milliseconds, and this instrument runs in 5 milliseconds, and that five milliseconds gives you a small offset because your device isn't fully settled. They'll never get those two instruments to correlate. So you can perform baseline comparison of the two instruments by increase the delay factor on one or the other of the instruments. Try to get the time to match. If you want two instruments to correlate, time is your biggest thing that you need to correlate. 
and also check your cables, adapters, probes to see if you've got leakage between the two different systems. Maybe you're getting excessive noise in your measurement. You want to know what the most common excessive noise that I see is? Our graph auto scales. So our graph, if you've got 10 ppm of noise across your measurement, the graph will auto scale it and blow the noise up to full scale. <laughs> you look at it and you go, wow, look at that noise is going all the way over the graph. Well, you know, it's really not doing that. That's the graph auto scaling. So first of all, make sure it's actually excessive noise by comparing it to the specifications and what you would expect to measure, right? Sometimes you can disconnect your device and cables and run a baseline noise test. What's the instrument measure when nothing's connected to it? Make sure the cables are properly shielded and properly attached. Um, a lot of times people will choose too high of a current range or they'll choose a limited auto range that doesn't allow the current range to go to as low a level as they want to go to. So check your range settings. Make sure the instrument is ranging to where you want it to be. Sometimes you can increase the filter factor in A to D settings. The last thing that you want to do is increase your filter factor or change your A to D settings before you troubleshoot the root of your noise. Troubleshoot the root first. Make sure your cables and connections are good, that your ranges are good. You know, as a last step, um, increase the filtering or um, increase the A to D settings. Now, this is kind of a, a common issue. Glitches at range change points. You remember that I described to you that this, this SMU is like a big op amp and op amps use a resistor in the feedback. And so for me to change ranges, I have to change the resistor in the feedback. Well, basically one way to do that is to switch one resistor out and switch a new resistor in. If you do that, the op amp goes open loop and bad things happen at the output. So we don't actually do that. We actually have a patented algorithm for switching in our new resistor. But when you switch in a new resistor, particularly if you're going down in range, which is going up in resistance, you can get some extra settling time required and the instrument might go out and make a measurement before it's fully settled. And this will show up as a small discontinuity in your data at a range change point. So if you're running a curve of data and you see a small discontinuity in it, take a look and see if it's right at a range change point. And if it is, you may want to add just a little bit of delay factor to give that particular setup a little extra time to settle before after it does a range change. <laughs> the results are completely wrong. So uh, th th this is this is a great one. So most of the systems use the Keithley preamplifiers. Most of the time, the preamplifiers are mounted right on the back of the instrument, and they've got two triax connectors. They've got the source connector and the sense connector. Well, the connector on top is the sense connector. Connector on bottom is the source connector. For some reason, people mentally want to use the connector on top. So they'll come in and connect a triax connector to the sense line and run it out to their sample and connect it up and try and run it. Well, that's the sense line. That's tied through a 100K ohm series resistor to the source line. You've now put 100K ohms in series with your sample, okay? And it completely gives you erroneous results. I, I see it happen all the time. People connect the sense line only, forget to connect the source line up. You're much better connecting the source line only. The other thing they do is they you have to compare your actual connections that you've told the system in the ITM or the UTM with what you actually have connected. This, this can be complicated, particularly in a probe station. You have to chase the cables. You have to go to the rear of the instrument, make sure cable number one is on SMU number one, tied to probe number three. Okay, and that matches my settings in my ITM. So it's just, it's really nothing more than being careful that the way you physically connect the system matches the way that you set up the software. If you're using a switch matrix, uh, verify that you've got the matrix connected properly. We do research. Maybe we just have a bad dud. So I always keep 
a sampling of known good devices. So if I sit down on a new device or material and I get bad results, one of the things I could do is I could put a known good device there, set down my probes, run my standard test and say, yep, my known good device works good, the instrument's good, the cable's good, the settings are good, everything's good. Something in my material, something in my new device. Okay. So very nice to have a known good device to validate the system quickly. Uh, recheck your definition settings. Make sure you actually have set up the test the way you think you set up the test. Values um, that are ridiculous, like e to the plus 22, um, in some cases, it, it indicates the instrument may have hit compliance. Okay. Make sure the force connections are used, not the sense connection. All right. Remove the offending smooth channel and use another SMU. So maybe one of your source measure units has gone bad in the system, swap in a different one. If you're using three, switch it over to four, switch your definition, run it again, and see if it works fine. Sometimes I'll even tie a SMU to a SMU. I have him source voltage and have him measure voltage and see if I have a SMU, check a SMU. All right, in the Kixi, um, let's, let's skip Kixi programming in, in the interest of time. Connections are a big deal. Even if the 4200 itself is performing flawlessly, which 99.9% .9 of the time it does, it has a very low failure rate, poor connections can cause problems. You can get extra leakage and offset due to a lack of guarding or using coax cables or having contamination. Cables matter. You really need to use good quality tracks cables. If your probe system does not have good quality manipulators or positioners, you need to consider, is it time to upgrade that probe system? You can get excessive noise from a lack of shielding. Now, a lot of the older probe systems don't have good shielding. And I can tell you, a lot of times I've walked into a lab and I've seen an entire probe station wrapped in aluminum foil. <laughs> you can go down to the grocery store and buy aluminum foil for like three bucks and try and wrap the probe station up and then ground the aluminum foil. And it actually might help a little bit. But shielding matters, particularly at low voltage and low current. Intermittent problems might be caused by poor contacts. So dirty probe needles are a big problem. Bent probe needles are a big problem. It can be difficult to make good contact if you have dirty probe needles and bent probe needles. So verify you're actually able to contact your sample. Oscillations. Now we see oscillations caused by a variety of things. You have device oscillations and you have source measure unit oscillations. If you put enough capacitance on the output of a source measure unit, it will oscillate. And when I say oscillate, I mean it will go to an unstable condition where a ring is an oscillation. It may eventually settle out, but it's still essentially unstable. Or it may oscillate forever. Now, here's a, here's a classic way to identify that. Somebody mentioned earlier that sometimes they can hear the range relays clicking in, in the source measure unit. If you hear lots of range relay clicking, that means the source measure unit or the device is oscillating and the source measure unit's trying to find which range is the proper range. Now, this particular instrument won't, won't search more than five times, so it shouldn't click more than five times. Then it'll go up range, make a measurement, go to the next data point and attempt to do it again, and then it'll click five times again, okay? So if you have an excessively slow measurement with a lot of clicking, the unit may be range hunting, and there's some things you can do for range hunting. <clears throat> um, you're getting purely nonsense results. It's just, it just looks like something's unconnected, a cable's bad, it's just nonsense results. You have incorrect connections or your signal routing. This is a huge problem. People connect things up. I connect things up wrong almost every time. The first time I'll connect it up, I'm being in a hurry, I'll connect, connect, and I'll go and run it and I'll get bad data. All right, and I'll walk around, then I'll carefully check my connections. 
Oh yeah, I got these SMUs swapped, okay. <clears throat> um, if you have devices that are getting destroyed or if you're damaging your 4200, it's really hard to damage a 4200. Um, in fact, I, I don't know how you could damage it. The only way you could damage a 4200, you'd have to take an SMU and plug it into a light socket or something, okay? I mean, you really, you really, you know, when we were designing and building this instrument, <clears throat> we said, you know, what, what's some of the nastiest things we could do to it? So we took and we tied a file, you know, a file that you file metal with? We tied one end to ground, we tied the other end to a SMU cable, and we went, brrr, all right, and ran it down the file. That's open short, open short, open short, as fast as we could run it down the file, right? I mean, we just hammered the SMUs. Um, we would take this SMU at plus 200 volts and this SMU at minus 200 volts and cram them together. Well, that's what happens if a device fails and shorts, right? So we cram them together. So really, there's almost nothing you can do uh, to the SMUs to damage it, but you can damage your devices, your DUTs. Now, <clears throat> I will recommend this. On this new system, but not on your older systems. But on this new system, we have put in what we call an absolute voltage limit. So you can actually go into, I believe it's in KCON, and you can actually say, I don't care what I tell you to do, and I don't care what happens to the connections, don't ever go over 5.5 volts or whatever. It's programmable, you choose the level. So we, we had a lot of people using this unit for nanotechnology on extremely sensitive uh, nano wires, and they would do things like they would have uh, 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 source sense lines down and a source line would slip off, right? Because it's very difficult to probe. And all of a sudden the unit would go to 10 volts momentarily, poof, it vaporized their very delicate sample. So we put this in what we call an absolute voltage limit, and the, the unit won't exceed that voltage limit. It clamps at that voltage limit. So the newer versions have that. If you're working with extremely sensitive devices, you may want to consider going and setting up the absolute voltage limits. <clears throat> Do any of you use a nanoprober? It's one of the new generation of nanoprobers. Oftentimes they're in a cryo chamber or a vacuum chamber. They're capable of probing down to, you know, maybe uh, uh, 50, 50 nanometer or even smaller devices. No? Okay. Okay. You want to use the high quality triaxial cables throughout. Try to use the Keithley cables. Now we realize in a laboratory environment, cables tend to get mixed up, they tend to walk away, right? But try to use high quality cables. You try to keep track of Keithley's cables. We invest a lot of time and energy in making good cables. <clears throat> high quality tracks cables will only add a few tens of femtoamps to the measurement, okay? Low quality cables can add hundreds of femtoamps. Coaxial cables can add picoamps to nanoamps. Boy, you know, in the old days, we used to have um, the same connection lugs on the coax and the triax. We had what was called, there's two connection lugs on a coax, if you look at it. If you look at a triax today, it's got three connection lugs. Well, in the old days, triax had two connection lugs. And you could, if you tried, jam a coax onto a two-lug triax and screw it on there. As soon as you did, you've ruined that triax connector. And now no longer, you can no longer plug a triax on it. Huge problem. But we don't have that problem anymore since we've now got three-lug triax. <clears throat> You want to consider the entire signal path from the 4200 all the way to the device pads, including cables, pass-throughs, switches, adapters, manipulators, probes or test fixtures, or probe needles. It's amazing how many problems I see with probe needles. Probing is not easy. It's an art that takes time to learn how to do. Of course, never connect the sense only. You can use the force all by itself. This is an auto-sensing instrument, and force works very well all by itself. In fact, 90% of people only use the force connection. But you can't make a mistake and use the sense only. You will have problems. <clears throat> if you're using a switch matrix, make sure that you're not attempting to do something that's beyond the specification of the switch matrix. <laughs> and poor physical connection, for example, an, oxi an oxidated 
probe contact will result in hard to trace source of measurement errors. It's really hard to tell if you got good probe contact or not. And as your probe contacts get dirty and your probe needles get dirty, it gets even harder and harder to tell. <clears throat> so here are the top 10 most common user errors. One through five. Connect the Trax cable to the sense terminal instead of the force terminal. Who was it that used to do the, the top 10 thing? Was that a Johnny Carson thing? I, I can't remember. Somebody used to do the top 10 thing. This is the top 10 measurement error list, right? Attempting high voltage tests without engaging the interlock. Remember, you can go in and do a software override on the interlock and the unit will run with no interlock and it won't give you an error but it'll stop making voltage at about 35 volts or so, okay? And you, if you don't know that the interlock is not engaged, you won't know that and you'll say, why is my device clamping at 35 volts? Okay. You're unable to execute a new test module. Is that a question? Yes, please. Yes. Uh, we have some uh, Azure 4156s. Yes. With the, 40, uh, with the micro manipulated probe stations that we have. Okay. And they supply this interlock cable with a switch. So when the lid's lowered, uh, you have, uh, you can apply high voltage, not. Okay. Can supply the same with this, or is it, can we use the same switch and just change the interlock cable? All right, so, so the question was, we have an older system that has, um, uh, was set up to work with an old, old probe station or an older parameter analyzer that had the switch on the probe station. When I close the lid, the switch is made. That's um, all you have to do is we supply this with an interlock cable. It's a three pin connector. If that doesn't match the connector on your probe station, all you have to do is cut the connector off and wire the two appropriate pins to the switch. That's pins number two and three, all right? And if you wire that to the switch, it will work fine. It will provide the interlock for this. So this is a three pin connector, pins one, two, three. Pin number one has got five volts on it. Pin number two and three is just detecting whether the switch contacts are made or not made. You wire pins two and three of the switch. When they're open, the interlock um, will not be made and the unit will not make voltage at all unless you have the over software override on. When they're closed, the system will work fine. It will make as much voltage as you tell it to make. Um, we use a standard three pin connector. You can buy it from a variety of places. So if you would like to, uh, if our connector doesn't match your probe station connector and you want to rewire your probe station to have the appropriate connector, you can buy the connector or you can just take us and wire us directly into your switch. Right? Remember our interlock is removable from the rear of the instrument also. So <clears throat> if you wanted to configure multiple probe stations, each with their own interlock cable, then you could just unplug it, wheel the system to the next probe station, plug it back in. So when you close that from two to three terminals, you have to just connect. You have to connect through a resistor or direct? Um, the question is, how, I think the question is, how much resistance are we allowed between them? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> it's a, you know, it was intended to work with a switch. I don't know if a K ohm would be a low enough path. I don't. I really don't know what the sense element is on the interlock. Because I remember some particular amount of resistor, we have to connect them, then it works for a high voltage. Yeah, on, on, the, uh, on the 4200, it was designed to work with the switch, essentially a couple of ohms to an open circuit, okay? okay. Um, uh, obviously, the way the 4200 works is that path is directly in a disconnect relay path. So you gotta have enough current to actually have the disconnect relay disconnect the 200 volt source. So. I'd like to add here, Keith, though, that that's not recommended. You yeah. should not try to fool the system by shorting the, the pins. Uh, right. To, because it's for safety. Yeah. For safety you reasons. You do that, but uh, it's, it's not recommended. Not right. Recommended. Okay. Right. Thank you. 
Let's see. Da, 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 da. Okay, you're unable to execute a new test. In other words, you have created a new test, but there's no green run button. Well, all new tests have to be saved the first time. Once they're saved, then we do a, a series of checks on the test, and if it's executable, we'll light up the green run button. So many people will create a new test, they'll forget to push the save button. All right, new test. This is not a test you pull out of the library. That's already been saved before. That'll be fine. It's just when you create a new one, you have to click save the first time. <clears throat> you see data on the sheet, but not on the graph. Well, probably because you haven't defined the graph. And this often will occur when you go back into your test and you change the name of a parameter. <clears throat> That'll change the name in the sheet and the graph references vectors by name in the sheet. So you change a name in, in, in the test definition and you no longer have a graph defined. Just go into the graph and redefine it with the new names. Oops. Um, you're using coax cables for low current measurements. Many, many people have coax cables in their lab. Most of them are communication cables. You even see 75 ohm television cables, right? And people constantly are trying to hook up coax cables because that's what they have in the lab. You cannot get low current measurements with a, with a coax cable. Not with an SMU. Um, you can't launch Kite applications when logged in under a new user account. Now you remember we said when you first start the 4200, you have to log in to Windows. The standard login is K-I-U-S-E-R, K-I-User, all uppercase, with no password. However, some system administrators will ask you to have your own login. If they create a login for you, they have to run the Keithley initialize new user. They have to do that for a new user to tell Kite there's a new user. Kite keeps track of users that way. Okay. So if you choose to have new users or you add yourself as a new user, run that. In Kixi, you receive data 99e to the 36th for each data point. Um, you have to use the li command. People often forget to use this li command in Kixi. In KCON, you try to configure a switch matrix connections, but you don't see any device pins. That's because you forgot to add a test fixture or a probe station in KCON. That's what defines the device pins. In Colt, you have failing to indicate library dependency dependencies leads to build errors. What happens is in Colt, you reference some external command to some other library and you don't include that in the dependencies. That's a C programming error. <clears throat> in our WLR toolkit, we actually have, we didn't cover that in our training, but we have the ability to cycle at the subsite level and stress devices between testing. So we can run a complete sequence of tests and then go to our stress engine, and our stress engine then provides whatever stressing you've defined. Could be pulse stressing, could be DC stressing, for whatever period of time you defined, and then it comes back and runs the tests again, and it records shifts in the data with stress, standard wafer level reliability testing. Well, you go and you set up all that testing, and then you click the run button, and it just runs through once. Well, what you forgot to do was click the Run Subsite Cycles button. All right, that's a different run button than the green run button. So if you hit the green run button, it'll only run once. You run the Subsite Cycles button, it'll, it'll run multiple times. Okay, in KCON, we have what's called the Self-Test button. This self-test button is available for all internal plugged-in instruments. It forces the instrument to go through a series of self-checks. We call them built-in test or BIT. Okay. Um, this gives you a very complete picture of the health of the instrument. Right? Rarely do you actually need to go do this. This is a last step, only if you're pretty sure the instrument's not functioning right. 
This will be done with uh, putting the box in my tax cable or without cable? That would be without cables. So the question was, can I leave things hooked up or can I leave a cable hooked up? Self-test is intended to be run with no cables attached. Um, so when self-test completes, you get a, a pass-fail window and it will give you uh, also an error message as to what failed in self-test. If you record that error message and contact Keithley, we can tell you, uh, you know, what, what is failing. Um, sometimes self-test will fail. Those things happen sometimes. Run it a second time. If it fails a second time, you know, you're definitely broken. <laughs>